now look to Dr. Gail Bradbrook to continue the case for the proposition. Here, here. Forced from their land during the enclosures, British workers were not allowed access to walks or areas of natural beauty. So in 1932, over 400 people from Manchester and Sheffield took part in a mass trespass on Kinder Scout in the Peak District. They told the local press and they were met by gamekeepers and the police and five of them subsequently went to jail. The movement that they kick-started by this action led to the creation of our national parks. Emmeline Pankhurst <coughs> spoke of the noble art of window smashing she said it had been crucial in winning the vote for men, and so she adopted the tactic as a suffragette. From Rosa Parks in the Civil Rights Movement to the Salt Tax March led by Gandhi, from Mary Barber's rent strikes to the Boston Tea Party, the effectiveness of breaking laws to demand change is well established. Social science dedicated to its study to understanding the mechanisms of civil resistance was fathered by Jean Sharp. So, for example, we understand that it's not the role of Extinction Rebellion to be, to be liked by people. It's our job to create a space and to get a, a conversation going. And in that way, we have definitely helped to shift an Overton window that badly needed to be shifted. Examples of civil resistance include more recent history, the demands to tackle the AIDS crisis and gay rights were highlighted by the disruptive actions of ACT UP in the 1980s. And GM crops were resisted by genetic snowball pulling up the crops and uh, sharing documents about how to do that, a protest that even Prince Charles took part in. So the 60th anniversary of Kinder Scout in 1992 was celebrated with another mass trespass. It started a new movement, and that led to the Right to Rome Act of 2000. So basically, many of the rights and freedoms that you now enjoy came alongside those willing to break the law. You can always point to an ecology of organisations and actions within any social movement, but the successful ones include non-violent civil disobedience. It's been interesting listening to colleagues talking about the science. I think you've got it wrong, actually. I don't think you understand how bad it is, to be honest. Um, the first IPCC report on climate change was in, completed in 1990, and carbon emissions have since gone up by 60%. In that time, all the actions you talked about, love, were tried. Three days ago, it was announced that there'll be a new coal mine in the UK, and HS2 will cause the big, biggest deforestation in the UK since World War I, whilst providing an airport shuttle service to an expanding aviation sector in the UK. Our parliament declared a climate emergency and then set a date of 2050 for decarbonising. Now, how do you go about doing that? You've got to do it within a carbon budget. How do they do that within the carbon budget that's available? They have to cut by about 24% a year, and the British government are cutting by 1.5%. So how are we going to go from 1.5% to 24%? You've got to have a plan. We signed the Paris Agreement in 2004. There's no plan. There's no plan, folks. So the only justification for the lack of a plan is based on the magical thinking. It's been called magical thinking by scientists writing in Nature, that there's going to be this carbon capture and storage technology that's going to become viable and scalable, and then we can suck the carbon back out of the atmosphere in, at some point in the future. So to the young people in the audience, it's outrageous that your generation is literally being left to fucking suck up the mess that my generation's leaving you. And you've only been given a 50% chance of succeeding. But it's actually worse than that because carbon capture technologies ignore crucial climate science focused on the breaching of tipping points. It's like a ball running down a hill. When it's running down, you can't cap catch it. Tipping points that are currently happening include the melting of the Arctic ice. When it's gone, you get the albedo effect. And the forest fires that are happening across the globe, and you're right, some of them have been started deliberately 
But when you've got Saddleworth Moor on, fi on fire in, in February in the UK, you know, something's fucked up. Um, in September, the IPCC just this year reported on the most frightening tipping point of all, the melting of the permafrost. It was in David Attenborough's film as well. It's frozen methane. Methane's the worst greenhouse gas. They call it the, uh, the methane dragon. 70% of the permafrost is set to melt on our current trajectory. So you can look at climate science from like physics and ecology, but you can also look at the geological record. And part of that, there's been five mass extinction events in the past. We're in the sixth one now. The worst one was when 97% of all life on Earth died. It's called the Permian mass extinction. And it was through a mechanism like the permafrost melt. And Penetal show that uh, we're heating the planet in a similar degree to the Permian mass extinction. That's data that we can look back on. Human extinction in our lifetime. Ramanathan and Zoo give it a 1 in 20 chance that we've already put you young folks on an aeroplane that's going to crash, just with the carbon that's already in the atmosphere. Another scenario is that the majority of the world's population dies. Professor Jonas Rockström said that scientists can't actually focus on a four degree warming, and that's the current pathway that we're on. He said that he reckons about only half a billion people would survive. That's by the end of this century. That's in your lifetime, right? That's seven billion people die. When, when Roger said it was six billion on hard talk, he just didn't do the maths right, seven. Um, before then, we can expect the collapse of civilization. We've been warned about it by folks like Sir David Attenborough. Professor Jem Benzel is the author of the most downloaded academic paper on climate change, and by Professor Hans Schellnuber of the Potsdam Institute. The trigger for collapse of civilization will be food shortages, in what academics term multi breadbasket failure. Anglia Ruskin University said, it, uh, said four years ago it will happen by 2040, but the NASA Goddard Institute said that the risks increase and it's coming faster. Civilization collapse is associated with war, mass rape, disease and famine. You only need a few El Nino events, uh, folks, and that's what's coming. Can we be certain of the, these risks? No, but we're told that the risks are increasing including recently by those well-known eco-warriors, the International Monetary Fund, who said the risk of catastrophic and irreversible disaster is rising, implying potentially infinite costs of unmitigated climate change, including human extinction. Climate change communications has been understating the risks because of pressures on the climate science community, and it led Dr Wolfgang Knorr to say the profession has let down humanity. A 2016 report called Unthinking the Unthinkable showed that our leaders in government and business are incapable, incapable of facing catastrophic risks. I think they're actually committing crimes against humanity and breaking Article 2 of the ECHHR. Um, so we've created these problems, folks, and they are going to get worse, but we can do things to avert the worst of it. We've acted swiftly before in times of great peril. The ideas are there, transition plans are drawn up. What's needed is political will to stop us harming and start repairing the damage. Since the Extinction Rebellion protests, the acts of civil disobedience, though not in isolation, have led to a waking up of the public to the devastation we're causing. We're doing a job where the media's failed us. So you can see from a YouGov poll a spike in people being genuinely concerned about the environment. And now 54% of people say it'll affect how they vote. Rebels breaking the law are supported by a further 10 people that don't break the law. You don't have to get arrested to take part in this rebellion. Well, I respect the law of these lands, but I'm shaken when I see the abuses through the use of injunctions, through tax avoidance, law avoidance, and when missing law is, is, is there as well. We need ecocide law in the Rome statutes. But I don't break the law because necessarily that I believe it's work. It's a long shot, but inaction is guaranteed to fail us. I cannot take the written law of these lands as being my ultimate guide. The laws of nature cannot be ignored. The imperative is to listen to my heart, to my conscience, and to the higher laws of love, truth, and justice. And I'm hopelessly in love with life on earth. I'm asked by these higher laws to set aside my own security, my reputation, potentially my own freedom and safety, and to listen to a better part of myself, to honour 
and be in service to life on earth. But do you know what? If that all sounds a bit holy and messianic, speaking like that, let me add that I also listen to the mischief maker in me. For it can be deliciously sexual, folks, to break the law. (laughs) And they actually got the handcuffs out last time, which I was delighted about. (laughs) To feel the abundance and the togetherness and our power as we take to the streets and refuse to cooperate with a system designed to kill itself, designed to kill itself and take us with us. So with both your base chakras and your higher purpose aligned, I hope you'll join me in the rebellion. Thank you.